sorry, gentlemen. I realize this place is you in an awkward position. But I know these Comanches. Particularly, I know Chief Santanda. If he's made up his mind to fight, he's going to fight. That's all there is to it. We were sent here to talk peace with the Indians. Well, what are we to say to the president? I cannot take the responsibility of permitting you to go any further into Indian country. But, Colonel, our instructions from the president clearly state that you have to provide us with an army escort. An escort? Do you see that ridge over there? The first one. My entire force could move a mile beyond that without a pitched battle. I don't think you'd be of much use to the president without your scouts. Sentry reports a mounted force of engines, sir. It looks like an attack. Those two in front. They look like white men. Why, those Indians are an escort. Hold your fire. 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 What's the meaning of this, Slocum? Yeah. Your name's gonna turn the whole army out for his son. Meet Colonel Grimes. What do you do, Colonel? Who are you? Well, my name is Stanley. I'm a reporter for the New York Herald. Newspaper man? Didn't you know better than to take this, this... civilian into Indian territory? Well, I tried to talk him out of it, but he's so dead set on seeing the old chief, why, I just... Chief Santanta? Yep. You mean to say you saw Chief Santanta? I'm sorry, I can't tell you that. Come on, Jeff, we've got to get to the railroad and telegraph our story back to New York. Just a moment, Mr. Stanley. This is field headquarters for the United States Army. These two gentlemen are the President's peace commissioners. You'll oblige me by answering their questions. I'm sorry, Colonel, I can't do that. You can't or you won't. Well, if you want to put it that way, Colonel, I won't. Suppose I place you under arrest. Maybe that will change your mind. You won't arrest me, Colonel. I know my rights. My paper sent me to get a story, and I got it. Until it appears in print, it's the exclusive property of my boss, James Gordon Bennett. The president's going to hear about this. He'll hear about it when everybody else does, when he reads it in the New York Herald. Come on, Jeff. Come in, son. Good day, Colonel. Copy. Now, I take these to help me mind my own business. Hurry! Yes. Just a moment, gentlemen. I've listened to you with patience. Now, apparently, you don't like the way I run my paper, but it's my paper, and that's the way I intend to run it. I intend to feature in the Herald first-hand, up-to-the-minute news of sensational events. And for your information, Senator, I intend to go on telling the truth about graft and corruption in high places. The more prominent the rascal, the bigger the news. And furthermore, gentlemen, I intend to continue making news while my competitors sit around waiting for it to happen. Now, suppose you get down to the business that brought you here. You came to buy me out, didn't you? Well, that is more or less what we plan to discuss with you. Now, if you'll let us know your lowest price for the Herald. One cent daily, five cents on Sundays. What is it, Albert? Mr. Stanley is here, sir. Well, show him in. Ben is waiting for you. Hello, Stanley. That was a great story. Thanks, Jim. Thank Welcome back. Ben is waiting to pin a leather medal on you. Let was see. any of it true? Why, well, you know me better than that. <laughs> Excuse me, Jeff. I made it up out of my own little head. Glad to see you. Hello, Mr. Stanley. Hello, Billy. Well, how are you? Welcome. Say, say, were those real Indians? Why, the realest Indians you ever saw. Billy, I want you to meet Jeff Slocum, the best Indian scout in the whole Wyoming Territory. 
Howdy, bub. Keep an eye on him for me, will you? But don't believe everything he tells you. Yes, sir. As a matter of fact, Billy, don't believe anything he tells you. Glad you're back, Mr. Stanley. How are you, Albert? Mr. Bennett's ready for you. Stanley! How are you, Mr. Bennett? Glad to see you. Thanks. Sit down. Another delegation from Boss Tweed still trying to buy me out. How about letting me do a series on Tweed and that gang of grafters sometime? I'm under the heading of amusement. Good job you did in Wyoming. Great story. Beat the town with it. Beat the whole country. See, how does it happen this man Slocum is still on your expense account? Well, he took care of me like a baby for four months. I promised him a trip to New York and we came out with our hair still where it should be. It's on you. Mm. All right, all right. I'm glad you're still alive. Me too. Have a cigar. Thanks. Stanley? What do you know about Livingston? Livingston? You mean the new bartender over at Joe's? No, no, no. I mean Dr. Livingston, the missionary, the explorer. Oh, oh, Dr. Livingston. Oh. Well, now, if you'd read a good newspaper once in a while, like the London Globe. Read that. Just come over the Atlantic Cable. The London Globe's expedition to Africa to find Dr. Livingston has just returned to Zanzibar from the African interior. Mr. Gareth Tice, leader of the expedition and son of the publisher, is prostrated with a tropical fever. The expedition, however, reports it has obtained positive proof that Dr. Livingston is dead. Well, I guess that settles the old boy. If I can prove that Tice is wrong about Dr. Livingston, I'll make him the laughing stock of every newspaper office from Park Road and Fleet Street. Now get ready. You're going to Africa. What? I'll have that old walrus on toast. Oh, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. While you're having that old walrus on toast, what am I supposed to be doing? Finding Livingston. Oh, I see. Is that all? Not losing your nerve, are you? Now, wait a minute, Mr. Bennett. I've got a little reputation of my own. Where do I come off? Suppose this old what's-his-name is alive and I prove it. Where's your reader interest? Where's your story? Well, you don't suppose I'd be sending you all the way to Africa if there weren't a story? For a whack at Tice, you'd send me to... And you know it. No, 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 no. Forget about Tice. He means nothing to me. It's a story I'm interested in. Well, where is it? How many people ever heard of Livingston? A great many more than you think. Christians who believe in spreading the word of God among the heathen. Enemies of slavery who know of the magnificent fight that doctors making against the slave traders. How many of those people read the Herald? And all the millions, the plain, common, everyday people who derive excitement from reading of the adventures of the heroic figures in the dark places of the earth. There's your reader interest, Stanley. Dr. Livingston's a great adventurer, one of the greatest. Come here, I'll show you something. The dark continent, mystery, heat, fever, cannibals, a vast jungle in which you could lose half of America. A land which even the greatest conquerors never dared penetrate. Alexander, Caesar, the pharaohs of Egypt, none of them. Unchanged, untouched, since the dawn of history. And somewhere, somewhere in there, a grand old man, a man of God, who's given his life to spreading light in its darkness. There's your story, the real story. But you don't think so. And besides, it would be extremely dangerous. So perhaps we'd better just forget about it. Let's see. You said you want to do a series on uh, Boss Tweed. Harper's Weekly has a young artist named Thomas Nast who's been doing some sensational cartoons on the Tweed ring. Better have a talk with him. Where was he heard of last? Oh, Tweed? Livingston. Oh, somewhere in the Tanganyika district. You'll find Nast up at Harper's. How long would it take to get there and back? The Harper's? Tanganyika. Oh, a year or two, maybe three. Hmm, just overnight. And you think it would make a great story? I mean, finding Livingston. The greatest story in the history of journalism, if you get it. I'll go. The steamer Great Eastern sails for London on Saturday. I've already reserved passage for you. Draw $5,000 now, and when that's gone, draw another five, and that's gone, draw another, and another, and another. But find Livingston. 
Suppose Tice is right and Livingston is dead. Well, then there's no story. I think there is. I'll bring him back in alcohol for Barnum's new museum on 14th Street. said, howdy. Well, how do you do? Uh, is it all is that color? What color? Well, it ain't red. As a matter of fact, it isn't. I ain't seen you before. When did you get on board? I came aboard last night at Suez. Yeah. You live in this part of the country? I beg pardon? I say, do you live down in this part of the country? No, my home is in London. London, huh? That's where those Englishmen come from, ain't it? Quite so. Hello there, son. Where you been? Oh, Say, I want to introduce you to my young friend, Mr. Stanley. This is Mr. Mr. I I didn't quite catch your, your name, partner. Tice. How do you do? Did he say Tice? What I thought he said. Jeff, if Mr. Tice is who I think he is, Bennett's going to raise your salary. Mosey around until I get back. <laughs> Beautiful weather, isn't it? Yes, yes, delightful. A little hot. Yes, quite sultry. Is that the uh, London Globe? Well, well, do you, do you mind if I look at this? No, of course not. Thank you. I'm lost without my Globe. Oh, you read the Globe, do you? Religiously. Rather a good paper, don't you think? Finest in the world of its kind. But you're an American, aren't you? Yes. Uh, quite a large percentage of Americans read. Really? You don't say so. I, uh, I guess you don't remember me. Stanley? Henry M. Stanley? Yes, we've just met. I'm the publisher of the Globe, you know. Oh, really? Well, you certainly can be proud of it. Well, thank you, thank you. Won't you sit down, Mr. Yes, Stanley? thanks, thanks. This expedition of yours to find Dr. Livingston, few publishers would have had the courage or the editorial shrewdness to attempt it. Yes, well, we tried to be progressive and alert. My son, you know, led the expedition. He's been desperately ill with fever ever since, poor lad. Oh, that's too bad, sir. I'm on my way to Zanzibar now to bring him home. At least his illness wasn't in vain, since he solved the mystery of Dr. Livingston's disappearance. Oh, then your son did find him? Well, virtually. Of course, if we're inclined to split hairs, he didn't actually find the grave, but... He did interview people who were present at his death. You mean he took their word for it that they were present at Livingston's death? Yes, why do you ask? Well, I was wondering if uh, there was any more evidence of his death than had already appeared in the Globe. It's not our policy, sir, to withhold news from the public. The Globe prints all the facts and nothing but the facts. Even when they're only rumors? Rumors? What do you mean, rumors? Well, I mean that evidence like that would hardly hold in a court of law. Are you a lawyer? No, no, I'm a newspaper man. A newspaper man? Yes, sir, I'm a reporter for the New York Herald. For Bennett? That sensation monger with his pushing Yankee rag? Would you mind telling me, sir, what you are doing here on your way to Zanzibar? No, uh, uh Mr. Bennett has sent me to try to find Livingston. <laughs> Lord Tice. Yes? Uh, you forgot your paper. <laughs> Got a match, Jeff? Yeah. This ain't no different color than them other oceans. Don't act no different, neither. Nice and quiet now, but I get a feeling I ain't gonna enjoy this trip. Jeff, I got a hunch Bennett is right. The Globe story of Livingston's death is nothing but a trumped-up lie from start to finish. Yeah. Some people just ain't got no respect for the truth. Now, son, if you excuse me, I'll get some business. Missy, 
Missy. Missy. Yes, yes, what is it? Big ship, she come. We'll send a carriage to the dock immediately. Yes, Missy. Splendid. Oh, you're such a sight. Darling, do be a dear and change your clothes and be brushed up when Lord Tice gets here. Who, my dear? Lord Tice. We're expecting him, aren't we? Yes, and you must make a good appearance. After all, while the consul's away, you're the representative of Her Majesty's government here. Yes, yes, my dear. To be sure, I am. <laughs> I'll wear my uniform. Well, Father, your uniform was appropriate when you were in China. But I've had your other suit all washed and ironed, and it will be so much better. Yes, yes, my dear, you're right. Quite right. All right, now. Come along, and please hurry. <coughs> the steamer's already in. I've sent the carriage for your father. Good. Did you take your quinine? Is that all you have to say to me when it's almost an hour since I've seen you? Did you take your quinine? No. Must you leave everything for me to think of? I was reading and the time slipped by. Gary, do you think your father will be able to have us transferred back home? No question he has influence. But a tough old bird is the governor. Doesn't believe in doing favors. He expects everyone to be as aggressive and self-reliant as he is. That's why I'm such a constant trial to him. I'm frightened to death of him already. Oh, you needn't be. He won't be able to resist you. As if anyone could. Come in and go out. I beg your pardon, is this Mr. Kingsley's house? Yes. I have some business with him. Are, are you Mrs. Kingsley? Miss Kingsley. My name is Stanley. I'm a reporter on the New York Herald. I see. Mr. Stanley, could you possibly come tomorrow instead? Oh, I could possibly, but I would like to see him tonight. We're dining in a very few minutes. I envy you. We have guests that... Excuse me. Oh, there you are. Please help me tie this tie. Father, you promised you'd wear your white suit. Oh, yes, of course I. Well, good night, uh, Miss oh, Kingsley. Oh. I'm sorry if I just... There's someone at our door. Oh, well, how do you do? How do you do, sir? This is Mr. Stanley, Father. He has business with you, but I told him we were dining directly. Oh, of course, of course. Delighted to have you. Any friend of Eve's is welcome. But, Father, Plenty I... for all. By all means, stay and dine with us, sir. Happy to have you, sir. Thank you. That's very kind of you. If you wish to stay, Mr. Stanley, you're welcome. Thank you. Did you remember to open the wine? The wine? Oh, yes, yes, of course. I'll, I'll see to it at once. You'll make Mr. Sidney at home, won't you? Perhaps you'd better come and meet the other guests. Thank you. I want you to get out of this abominable climate just as soon as possible. Lord Tice. This is Mr. Stanley, Lord Tice. Yes, I've already had the pleasure of meeting Mr. Stanley. Yes. And Mr. Tice, Mr. Stanley. How do you, How do, you do? Lord Tice and I had a very interesting chat on the boat coming down. This is the gentleman who, as good as insinuated, we were both liars. Oh, come, Father. From what you told me, the worst Mr. Stanley thinks of us is that we are a poor newspaper man. So you intend to have a whack at it yourself? Certainly. Why not? I wish you luck. Thank you. And I hope you don't have to be carried out. A stupid waste of time and money. Oh, well, why should we worry about Bennett's money? And I've got nothing but... Well, 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 here we are. I see you all know each other. Uh, will you please take the bottle? Mr. Tice led the expedition that went in to find Dr. Livingston. Mr. Stanley is here for the same purpose. Oh, really? Bless my soul. Well, splendid, splendid. I knew the doctor well, very well. A great man. Of course, you know, this was his house. He lived here. He still lives here. Hmm? You know, so many things he brought back. I'm sure you're all starving. We're dining in the garden. Oh, yes. Yeah. The queen. Lord 
Tice, you're not eating your papa. Can I get you something else? No, thank you. Papa is delicious. Mr. Stanley, may I inquire where the idea originated for this wild goose chase of yours into Africa? It was Bennett's idea. I think he got it from the London Globe. I thought so. I knew it. Another of his cheap Yankee tricks. The man who finds Dr. Livingstone will be doing a great service to the world. I'm glad to hear you say that, Mr. Kingsley, because I need your help. I'd like to get a pass to the island of Pemba, and I understand while the consul is away, you're the only man who can give me one. They say Pemba is unhealthy for white men. Oh, well, I'll have to take my chances on that. How about it, Mr. Kingsley? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What? The pass. The pass? To Pemba. Oh, yes, 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 by all means. I shall be happy to provide you with a pass. May I remind you? You'll forgive me for intruding, Mr. Kingsley, but it seems to me you're taking on yourself an extremely grave responsibility. Mr. Stanley is not a British subject, and if anything unpleasant should happen to him, Mr. Bennett, his employer, is quite capable of asking embarrassing questions of the Foreign Office. Thank you, Lord Tice. I appreciate your concern. I relieve you of all responsibility, Mr. Kingsley. Oh, well, then, in that case, there can't be any possible objection. Father. Mm, yes, my dear. Mr. Stanley is a newcomer here. He knows nothing of Pemba or its dangers. If anything were to happen to him, you would still be responsible. Oh, yes, yes, yes. There's something in what you say, my dear. I think this is a matter for the consul himself to decide. <laughs> but, Mr. Kingsley... Oh, no, 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 my boy. Eve's right. When the consul returns, I'll put in a good word for you. Thank you, Miss Kingsley. It was very nice of you to take in a poor, forlorn stranger and treat him so gently. My respects to your father and your guests. I will just go out this way. Thank you again for your help. That pass meant a great deal to me. Good night. Mr. Stanley. I, I'm sorry if I've ruined your plans. You seem to have plans of your own, Miss Kingsley. I had to do it to please Lord Tice. It's desperately urgent about my father. What's your father got to do with it? Well, I've simply got to get him back to England. Why? Well, you've seen him, you've talked with him, you know how he is. I don't see anything unusual for a man of his age. Of his age? He's barely 50. Africa has done this to him. It's killing him just as it killed my mother. And the cruel, pitiful thing about it is he... he still thinks he loves the place. He doesn't want to leave it. It's in his blood, just as it was with Livingston and all the rest of them. That's what I meant when I said Livingston still lives here. There's never a moment when his shadow isn't over this house. Oh, I know what he's done is fine and humanitarian, but everybody can't follow in his footsteps. And look at Father. It's only made him sick and bewildered and unhappy. I must get him away before it's too late. I'm sorry. I didn't know how things were. I wouldn't have butted in. Don't worry about the past. I'll get along without it. everything from a jackass to a wagon train, but I've never had no such trouble as I have with these here Zanzibaris. Well, Sal Belly and Flapjacks don't mean nothing in their lives. All right, Skipper, shove off. Belly! Mr. Stanley! Wait a minute. Are you completely out of your mind? Maybe. Why? You're going to Pemba without a pass. That's where the slave buyers go, isn't it? Yes, but not white men. They hate the whites for trying to stop the slave trade. And worst of all, they hate Dr. Livingston. If they were ever to find out that it's information you're after... What else did Lord Tice ask you to tell me? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. I... You're not the kind to do anybody's dirty work. I, I, I realize you're trying to help me, and I do appreciate it, but... I guess you'd better save your advice for somebody with sense enough to take it. I knew when you left me last night that you were that kind of fool. Sure, I admit it. Well, I didn't mean it as a compliment. I guess I'm just another kind. But if anything happens to you, 
Don't hold my father cheap cloth and mirrors are good as gold anywhere. Better, in fact. Uh, well, that's all. I, oh, oh, no, no, there's something I wanted to tell you and I can't think what it... Oh, yes, 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 yes. A letter for Dr. Livingston. And please give him my warmest regards. No address on him, Mr. Kingsley. Oh, that's true. <laughs> I don't know where he is now, or even if he's still alive. <laughs> oh, and Eve said she wants to see you. She's uh, out in the garden. Oh, thank you. Say, <laughs> speaking of howling savages, I remember once up in the Dakota Badlands, it was back in, uh, in 58. 58? <laughs> really? I remember the year well. I was... Oh, let me see now. Was it 59? No, it was 58. No, that's right, 58. And I, I was making a short journey up to Limpopo in search of zoological specimens. I, and on our third day out, we began to hear war drums. Yeah, well, Soon I... Soon, we were being pursued by large war parties from several tribes. Their witch doctors had told them we were first-class devils. I can hear them howling now. Ooh! Really going? Yes. Thanks to you for getting me that pass. I wish I'd never given it to you. Why? Because I don't want the credit for what's going to happen to you. Nothing's going to happen to me. You don't realize what's ahead of you. Do you want to come back like all the others? Broken, old before your time, shattered by something that's far too big for any of us to conquer. Do you think you can fight Africa alone and win? I guess I'd better make myself clear. Conquering Africa alone or with help doesn't interest me in the least. I'm no explorer and I certainly am no missionary. I'm not crazy about the idea of spending the next couple of years of my life scouring the jungle for an old missionary with a Bible in one hand and a bag of beans in the other. But if Livingston's alive, I'm going to find him. That's my assignment. Uh, I've got my reasons for wanting to fulfill it. It is nice to know that you care what happens to me. Wish me luck. Oh, I do with all my heart. I won't forget that. Make way for Her Majesty's Horse Marines! Gary! Oh, Gary, that's wonderful. Well, how does it seem to be walking again? It gives me an earnest desire to sit down. Oh, God, thank you. So you're really going, eh? You should have heard the governor rave when he learned you were about ready to start. He thinks you're trying to blast the foundations of British journalism. Oh, no, I'd as soon think of blowing up Westminster Abbey. Oh, you needn't explain to me. I'm not a journalist. And I've already proved that I'm not an explorer. When I was at school in Switzerland, I climbed the Matterhorn to win a five-pound bet, which gave my father the brilliant idea that I was just the man to scour the wilds of Africa for Dr. Livingston. When are you leaving? Tomorrow morning from the mainland. I wish you luck. I guess this is goodbye. I'll write to you. Where you're going, old man, you'll find quite a scarcity of post offices. All right, I'll deliver the letters personally when I come back. Oh, I see. Well, if she isn't here, I, I suggest you try London. All right, I will. I hope everything turns out the way you want it for your father. Bye. And by that time, there were only ten of us left. 
And six of those were so weak from fever, they could hardly stagger. The tribes were closing in, and when we camped that night, we were completely surrounded. Oh, must you be going? Yes, sir, we're moving to the mainland tonight. Oh, have you engaged all the bearers you need? The American consul at Bagamoya is taking care of that. Mr. Kingsley, I wish I could tell you how much I appreciate all you've done for me. Oh, not at all, sir. Not at all. I wish I could go with you. But they tell me I'm not quite up to a trip through the jungle now. There's nothing to match it, sir. Nothing to match it. The evenings in camp, a breeze cool off the plateau, a tropical river gleaming like silver in the moonlight, and the feeling of life around you everywhere. And more than anything else, the knowledge that you're thousands of miles from civilization, close to nature, as God made it. Well, goodbye, Mr. Stanley, and good luck. Thank you, sir. Goodbye to you, sir. Goodbye. We foreign his advice. Of course. He's an experienced explorer. Well, I don't know nothing about his exploring, but he sure is experienced at telling whoppers. Five days out, weather clear but hot, easy marching country. We have been climbing steadily ever since we left the coast, and the coolness of the nights proves that we have already reached a considerable elevation. Ahead lies the great plateau of equatorial Africa, a vast area of open country. We are the first to enter it from a point so far south. We are carrying what here in Africa amounts to a small fortune in trade goods. We are hoping to conserve our food supplies as much as possible by living off the country. Water is no problem. Abasi, Quienda, Quienda! This morning we saw our first game, a small herd of antelope. Although we have run across no dangerous animals during the day, their tracks are everywhere. And at night we have heard the lions hunting close to our camp setting up a great coughing and moaning, but apparently afraid of our fires. Our guides tell us that they will only attack men when starving, so we have little to fear from them in this land of plenty. I would call this a hunter's paradise. The valleys are alive with antelope and other game, including some new species that have not yet been listed by the naturalists. Lately, we have begun to see giraffes, although Mr. Slocum claims there ain't no such animal. Kingsley was right when he said there was nothing to match it. This is no empty wilderness, but swarming with life. What old P.T. Barnum wouldn't give for a few of these specimens? This is the greatest show on earth. I'm afraid Miss Kingsley was inclined to exaggerate the dangers of the journey. We've had quiet days and peaceful nights in camp. Way up on a high hill, the cliff a thousand feet down. Tell him that. Here was me. And here was 500 Comanches. Say, you sure you're telling us exactly right? Yes, master. A thousand Comanches. Coming closer and closer and closer. Nakuja Harbor and Philly Philly. The Harbor and Harbor. You say scalp in your lingo? Yes, Master. How do you say it? Nakamasi. Nakamasi? Well, tell him the engines was trying to get mine. Bang, 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 Saying. They saying you're the biggest liar in Africa. <laughs> I had always thought of Africa in terms of jungles and sweltering heat, but this open mountainous country is little different from our own great west. Only the profusion of game, the gaudy insects, and occasional strange tropical growth remind us that we are approaching the heart of the dark continent. Today we reached Ugogo, a well-populated region inhabited by a thick-chested, bumptious tribe who introduced us to the ancient African custom of honga. Honga means tribute, beads, cloth, and wire. 
graft for the chief from all caravans passing through his territory. Apparently, the spoil system is as well established in Africa as in New York. But the local boss Tweed is a friendly old crook who is willing to provide us with food and guides for the next stage of our journey at just double the regular price. Master, he say he know where the white man is. Where? Village on Pasha, two moon marsh. Tell the men to start packing. Find out all he knows. Tell him to pick Quite up and get going. We have been making rapid progress for the last few marches, gaining new strength through the belief that our search is nearing its end. In only a few weeks, I shall be back in Zanzibar. I wonder if Miss Kingsley would be surprised to see me. I wish she were here. I'm sure the beauties of this vast country would take away all her fears of Africa. Thousands of flamingos flying off toward a sunset painted in their own flaming colors. An omen for our success. I find myself thinking of her often. At last, the village. What will Dr. Livingston be like? White man in there. I don't know what to say. What do you say when you meet people in the middle of Africa? Why, well, I just say, howdy, pod, how's tricks? Yami, Panini. He's not a white man, he's Albano. Let's get out of here. Uh, you mean he's a black white man? No, he's a white black man. Our disappointment at Mabashi was apparently the signal for our luck to turn against us. Last night, another man was carried off by a lion, and two more died of dysentery, our worst enemy. When it strikes, the men drop like flies. The vultures follow us expectantly. The men are beginning to desert. Poor devils, I wonder if they'll ever reach the coast alive. We tramp on day after day, week after week, from village to village, endlessly questioning, endlessly receiving the same answer, not no, not no. It is so long since we have heard a single word of hope that even another false rumor would be welcome. I am beginning to get some conception of the immensity of this country. It's as if we had left New York on foot, hoping to find Livingston somewhere between Chicago and New Orleans. We have seen no human being in the weeks, but savage life is all around us and the fierce equatorial sun always overhead. I apologize to Eve Kingsley. I thought she was wrong, but she wasn't. I wonder why she was so anxious to help me. Me, a stranger who was never anything but a nuisance to her. She tried to save me from this. I wonder why. Maybe it was only because she knew that white men don't belong in this country. Livingston must be crazy, if he is alive, and that I am beginning to doubt. But I must never confess my doubt. I don't want the men to know that I am becoming discouraged. They call me Bula Matari, which means breaker of the path. I will not betray their confidence in me. Today we saw our first human beings in over three months. Slave caravan. Them slaves? You and Hassan stay with the men. Just master. Can you pass it? Anguka! Meda! Upesi! Upesi! How do you do? Speak English? I'm from Shatulia, Gaza. Hassan. Salam alaikum. Alaikum salam. Shoes are the only one you have You see, surprise the white man in this country. Ask him if he knows the way to Tanganyika. Tarpin, Bala, Tanaka, Niga, Tanganyika, Hadi Bala, the Bridi, Bridi, Tir, Bala, Rahman Honey, Allah, the same, Bala, the Onion Yem, Ahsanaway. 
It's, it just come from there. The place they call Yam Yambe, full moon march. It's the only best way to go there, is to go through the Yam Yambe. Ask him if he saw another white man. Shafter Rijal Abiy the Awal Mara, his name Dr. Levinson. Levinson? No, my name is Shaif Rijal Abiy Al Khalas Bel Bel. He never seen before a white man in this country. Give me my thanks and go back to the men. Salam alaikum, assalam. Alaikum assalam. Allah makum. That's a funny lingo. I never heard that before. Well, 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 I'm busy. I'm busy, well, well. What are they gonna get us? Figure it out for yourself. That slaver's caravan passed through this country. Maybe they'll powwow. Maybe.
Bizim Melina bu. Hasan, mahvet! Bu! this diary, take it to Mr. James Gordon Bennett of the New York Herald. Telling his story is written in the blood of the men I am leading to their deaths. And say to Eve Kingsley that there is a message in these pages for her alone to read. I never should have left her. Now it is too late, for I know that I shall never see her again. I can't go back. While I can walk, I am going on. And I will not leave Africa without Livingston.
get it? Yes, master. Who are these men? It's native from Tanganyika. They're friends. They're hunters. Tanganyika? Tanganyika? Yes, master. They want food. They're hungry. The other white men always give me food. Other white men? When? Where? Where? In Ujiji. What's white man's name? Jinayakanani. Mganga. Doctor. Livingston. Give them food. Give them whatever they want if they guide me to you, Gigi. You stay here with sick ones. Until I send for you, come back. I'll push on with a few men. Tomorrow? Now. <laughs> say that this lake is Tanganyika, this village Ujiji, Livingston's hiding place for which we have searched so long. It's hard to believe. I'm afraid it's only a feverish mirage and it will vanish before my eyes. After all these months of disappointments, can I dare believe that I have won? The next few moments will give me the answer. Yes. Thank God, Doctor, I've been permitted to see you. I'm thankful that I'm here to welcome you, Mr. Stanley. Mr. Stanley. You're not well, Mr. Stanley. Come in. I've had fever. I've been traveling day and night since I found out you were here. It's been over a year since we left Zanzibar. Sit down. <laughs> then it isn't merely luck that you came. No. No, I came to find you, Doctor. To find me. Susie! We, we, we have a guest for dinner. Set another place. Yes, Master. So long since I entertained that I... Juma! Juma! Nothing short of a banquet could do justice yes, to this Master. occasion. 
If you want, this is an occasion. We'll, uh, we'll have the fatted pig for dinner. Yes, master. You come from Zanzibar, you say? Je hapa. Tessa mini sana. Wetu umtu. New pig. Now tell me, Mr. Stanley, were you sent here by the government or by the Royal Geographical Society? Neither. I was sent by the New York Herald. Newspaper? Your front page news, Doctor. The whole world has been wondering what became of you. There have been a dozen rumors about your death, even that you had married a native princess. We'll settle all those rumors when I take you back, and alive. Then, the only reason that you were sent here was to get news for your paper. That's right, Doctor. How can I help you? We want the exclusive right to publish all of your signed articles. Naturally, we'll pay you for them. When we get through building you up, you'll be a sensational attraction, the hero of three continents. Of course, you can make your own engagements, lectures, and appearances, whatever you like. I see. I'm not ungrateful, Mr. Stanley. But you see, I'm neither lost, nor am I hiding. If I had intended to go back, I should have done so long ago. I have no intention of leaving Africa until my work here is finished. Oh, I know how you must feel after undergoing such hardships to discover that the man that you were sent out to rescue has no desire to be rescued. But then you see, I have been disappointed too. I thought that you'd been sent out to help me. No matter, I mustn't quarrel with the good fortune that brought you here. Master, Dinto is safe. For the blessings and the bounties thou hast placed upon this table, Lord, make me make us truly grateful. What are you doing there? Mama, you listen, Mama. You listen, Mama. Come on, what did you take? Give it to me. You listen, Mama. Who listen, Mama? Who listen, Mama? Who listen, Mama? What has happened, Mr. Stanley? I caught him going through my baggage. From your feet, Father. You struck him? Yes, of course. You shouldn't have done that, Mr. Stanley. Bongo, you promised me you'd stop stealing. Samasana, you to happen Ichibu. Now do to me we rahi more. Bongo says he is sorry and asks your pardon, Mr. Stanley. Ima. Ima. Andaka. Forgive me for speaking to you so sharply, Mr. Stanley. But you should never strike one of these simple people. They respond in kind to the treatment they receive. And they know enough of brutality without white men teaching them more. Bongo is making excellent progress. His good behavior used to be a matter of days. Now he can go almost a whole month without backsliding. I'm sorry that you were inconvenienced. Good night, Mr. Stanley.
escort for the rest of your caravan. Thank you. When you want your breakfast, just call Chuma. Fetch medicine box. Oh, come on. Let's have a look at it. There you go. Now lie down. Dinuska Kutuska. That's it. Chuma, plenty of hot water. Yes, Master. Where did you find a big thorn like that, Amber? On the other side, Susie. Mr. Stanley, would you mind lending a little moral support? Gladly. Omba here is a soldier, but he's got a thorn in his foot. It's gone pretty deep. And even a soldier needs a little encouragement, you know? Well, we'll give all the support we've got. What can I do to help? But no, 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 Omba, no, no. Yeah, I think it would be better if you hold his hands to stop him squirming around. There, yeah, Omba, there's nothing to be afraid of. <laughs> Mr. Stanley is our friend. Friend, Oima Sana, into Wima. Amber's not used to strangers, are you, Amber? You see, in the language of his tribe, stranger and enemy are the same word. Disinfecting Chuma. Now, Pete, take her. Pete, take her, Amber. Steady now. We ran out of carbolic two years ago. We found that the bark of one of our native uh, the bark of one of our native trees had remarkable healing qualities. We haven't had one case of infection since we used it. Steady now, Amber. Petetica. Now then, let's see what we've got here. Ah, it's better. There. All over. Good boy, Amber. Good boy. Nice and clean. Disinfecting. That's it. And the wound. That's it. That's the way. Amber will help. He's in splendid physical condition. His father was a Manyemia cannibal. If Amber hadn't come to live here, his teeth would have been filed by now. They're fine people, the Manyema, in many ways. 
strict sense of honor, magnificent physical specimens. They have a great capacity for leadership. Someday, Ambo will be a great leader, a teacher. <sighs> now, keep the bandage on or you'll get dirt in the wound. Very proud of Amba. He has real talent. From what I've seen of Africa, I'd say you've got a job on your hands. Oh, it's much the same in any new country. How do you suppose America looked to the first settlers who saw it only as an unknown wilderness teeming with hostile savages? Well, that's our trouble here in Africa. Thank you, Trudeau. Suze, bring my map case. Yes, Master. White men have seen Africa only through the eyes of ignorance. And that means through the eyes of fear. You're a newspaper man, Mr. Stanley. You know something of human nature. I may be in the market to learn something more. What keeps the white man away from Africa? Mm, a lot of things, I guess. Fear. Fear of the unknown. Thank you, Susie. Fear of a blank space on the map. Fill in that blank space. Drive away that fear and... Let me show you. <clears throat> This is the watershed for the whole continent. From here spring the great rivers that find their way to the Atlantic, the Indian Ocean, and the Mediterranean. Solve the mystery of those rivers, the Congo and the rest. Above all, solve the mystery of the source of the Nile, which has puzzled geographers since the days of Ptolemy, when you drive away the clouds of ignorance and fear. Give the world an honest, accurate map of Africa, and it is no longer the dark continent. Then others will come, not only missionaries, but doctors, teachers, pioneers. And they will bring civilization, drive away the slave trader, and spread word of the brotherhood of man in a continent which never before in all its history has heard one single syllable of kindness or hope. Well, I must say, Dr. Livingston, you're not exactly my idea of a missionary. Mine is a much maligned profession. It is possible, you know, to serve one's God faithfully without entirely losing one's human perspective. And now, if you'll excuse me, it's time for Sunday school. I have persuaded Dr. Livingston to take me with him on a visiting trip around what he calls his parish. This is undoubtedly the largest parish in the world, including as it does some thousands of square miles. The doctor is remarkable. Not only does he care for the souls and bodies of the people of the villages where we stop, but he takes a keen interest in natural history, classifying the flora and fauna we come across. Yesterday, we found a new and beautiful kind of bird which we have named Eve Kingsley's Egret, uh, after the daughter of the doctor's old friend. Also, we have made several side trips of exploration. His eternal quest to fill in those blank spaces on the map. There. Now we know for certain that the Rusizi River runs into Lake Tanganyika. That lion's getting mighty inquisitive. Well, he won't come near so long as the fire is burning. Guess I'll go out and see if they keep it burning good and bright. Are we moving on in the morning? Yes. There are rumors of an Arab slave raid in Urundi territory to the north. Doctor. Is it, sir? Uh, it's just recurrent fever. Jeff! Come on, lie down a little. No, I'm all right. No, no, lie down. Jeff! Please don't trouble I'll be quite dramatic. Get some quinine, Jeff, quick. You have quinine? Yes, yes. Uh -huh. My supply ran out a year ago. Never told me you had head fever. <laughs> I, I haven't had an attack for some months now. <laughs> I suppose it's in the bones. 
Well, I know one thing, Doctor. When I leave Africa, you're going with me. No, my son. If I left here, I should never come back. This is my life. My work. I... I shall stay here. Until I die. We are returning to you, Gigi. Never in my life have I known a man so uncomplaining. Even though he is racked with fever, he is already planning his next expedition, his next achievement. I thank God I have been permitted to know him. The weeks have passed quickly, too quickly. But all good things must come to an end. Tomorrow, Jeff and I are leaving on our return journey to the coast, and all you Gigi has turned out for a farewell party in our honor. getting a little shut-eye, don't you think? I have those letters for you, and one for Mr. Bennett as well. Thank you, Doctor. You know, Doctor, I've been thinking what a great story it would make if when Dr. Livingston discovers the source of the Nile, New York Herald expedition was with him. You mean that you would go to the Lua Laba with me? I would if you'd have me. I should be proud to have you. Son, you ain't aiming to go to no Lalapalooza River, are you? When did we start? About six months. Six months? We were useless to start until the rainy season is over. After all, my son, the river has been there for thousands of centuries. It's not likely to run away from us. No. No, but I'm afraid if we didn't start for six months, by the time we got back, Bennett would have another expedition out looking for me. But you can help if you want to. You know what I'm trying to do here. When you write your story about how you found me, write mine too. Be my voice. Tell them that I need assistance. Tell them that I need medicine, supplies, even other geographers, if that is possible. Tell them how much work there is to be done. Will you do that? Of course, Doctor. This time, I know my message will go through. I have found myself dreading the moment of farewell, that sorrowful word. But we are parting. I to civilization, he to his lone battle against incredible dangers and hardships. Weak as he is, he thinks only of his duty and his dream, with nothing to sustain him but his own high spirit and enduring faith in his God who he believes will bring all things right at last. My guides will take you as far as Unyamyambe. 
From there, you follow the watershed, keeping the mountains on your left, until you strike the main trade route. You should reach Zanzibar in a fifth of the time that it took you to come in. I'm counting on you, my son. I'll do my best, sir. I promise you that. I'll leave it with you. May God bring you to safety. Goodbye. Bye, Doctor. Doctor, I, uh, I almost forgot, sir. Would you give this to Bongo if you think he'd like it? I'm sure he will be most grateful. Thank you. She got my cablegram. Henry, I'm Stanley. Here? Are oh, you Mr. Stanley? Yes. Cablegram for you, sir. Thanks. You know, dear. Paper, evening paper. Evening paper, sir. Tells all the ladies. There she is. Yeah, Come on. The observer, Mr. Stanley. Oh, Mr. Livingston. Gentlemen, I'll give you my story later. Uh, here, talk to Mr. Slope. I'll be back in a minute. Yeah, Jeff, look after the bag. How's Mr. Livingston now? How's the observer? Eve. I beg your pardon. I mean Miss Kingsley. I beg your pardon, old man. You mean Mrs. Tice. Congratulations. I knew you'd do it. Uh, thanks. Thanks. Uh, uh, what have you done about your luggage? Uh, Jeff's looking after it. Oh, Slocum. Well, you get inside and talk to Eve, and I'll, I'll help him. We are putting you up, you know. Well, I'm, I'm glad to see you back. I'm glad to be back. It was stupid of me. I forgot to congratulate Gareth. Well, then, congratulate me. I do. I wish you all the happiness in the world. Thank you. Are you going to be in England long? No, no, I... Just long enough to take care of some business for Dr. Livingston. Oh, you say that so casually. As if it weren't the most wonderful thing that ever happened, finding him. But Gareth and I were sure you wouldn't fail. I had help. There were times when I nearly turned back. But something... I... I can't explain to you what it was. Something kept me going ahead. It was an inspiration that never failed me. You've changed. Yes, I've been wondering what it is about you that reminded me of someone. Now I know who it is. It's Dr. Livingston. Dr. Livingston? Yes. You have that same look about you. No. No, I'm afraid you're imagining things. I haven't changed. I'm still a reporter waiting for his next assignment. Sir John? Hi, oh, young Tice. Let me handle this. 
There's nothing I enjoy more than a good whack at the seats of the mighty. Sir Oliver? Yes? Ah, oh, yes, Tice. Forgive me for intruding, sir, but I feel this is truly an historic moment. Sir Oliver French, I have the great honor to present the man who found Dr. David Livingston. Mr. Stanley, I presume. Yes, sir, I'm Stanley. <laughs> Mr. Stanley, this is Mr. Vane. How do you do, sir? How do you do, sir? Permit me to congratulate you upon your incredible accomplishment. Incredible, perhaps, but nonetheless accomplished. If we seem a bit hesitant to accept Mr. Stanley's story at his face value, please don't think we... I know, you want the proof. Mr. Stanley has it. Has he? Mr. Stanley. Lord Tice. Did I understand my son to say you have proof that you found Dr. Livingston? Yes, sir. I have the documents here. Dr. Livingston instructed me to give you these, sir. Mm -hmm. An imposing mass of evidence, I must say. If it was compiled by Dr. Livingston. Oh, Father, for heaven's sake, be reasonable. I'll be glad to accept the judgment of the society. Well, nothing could be fairer than that, eh, French? No. Very well, Mr. Stanley. I'll appoint a committee to examine these documents and instruct them to make their report at our next general meeting at Brighton. Thank you, sir. I'm certain, Sir Oliver, that the meeting will be one long remembered by all of us. I'm certain it will. Dr. Livingston is supposed to have entrusted to Mr. Stanley. And here is a letter which I personally know was written by Dr. Livingston some 15 years ago when he was in England. I have carefully compared them, and in all honesty, I cannot conclude that they were written by the same hand. Would you say, Mr. Cranston, that they were written by two different hands? Yes, I should say so. But can't we assume that the trembling hand of an old man, racked with fever, will produce a different character of writing from that composed by a man in his prime, as Dr. Livingston was 15 years ago? That's an assumption, sir, not proof. Thank you, Mr. Cranston. And now, gentlemen, the maps which Mr. Stanley claims were drawn by Dr. Livingston have been examined by the expert cartographer, Mr. Frederick Holcomb. Uh, Mr. Holcomb. As there are no other maps of this unexplored territory with which to compare these, naturally I cannot accept them as correct. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kingsley. By the same reasoning, Mr. Holcomb could not possibly have accepted the maps of Christopher Columbus. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Isn't it true, Mr. Holcomb, that those maps could have been drawn as well or as poorly by a child who had never been ten miles from London? Well, that's putting it rather strongly, Lord Tice. Would you say that the rivers and mountains so generously indicated on those maps might not exist outside of Mr. Stanley's imagination? No, I shouldn't care to put myself in the position of having said that they are purely the figment of Mr. Stanley's imagination. But there is one point of fact, or of error, that should certainly cause us to question these records. Here is a river called the, uh, the Luarlaba River, indicated as flowing north and being the true source of the Nile. And further, gentlemen, indicated as being at an elevation of 2,000 feet above sea level. 2,000 feet. As we all know, our eminent colleague, Mr. Hampton, measured the elevation of the Nile above Gondokoro at 2,169 feet. Therefore, it seems, if we are to believe these records, that we must also believe that water could flow over 700 miles uphill. <laughs> Dr. Livingston indicated the Lua Lava as a possible, not the actual source of the Nile. The word possible, Mr. Stanley, does not appear on the map. Dr. Livingston said it was possible this was not the Nile, but the Congo. As to that, Mr. Stanley, even an elementary knowledge of geography should tell you that the Congo flows 
not north, but west. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, assuming that anybody found anybody, is it not likely that Stanley did not discover Livingston, but that Livingston discovered Stanley? <laughs> It must be obvious to even the most gullible of us that Mr. Stanley has attempted to make this honorable gathering the victim of a colossal fraud. You ought to know about fraud, you old rhinoceros. Sit down. It was my privilege to spend some time with Mr. Stanley at Zanzibar, where I had gone to be with my son, who had courageously led a bona fide expedition to find Dr. Livingston. When I told Mr. Stanley that Dr. Livingston was dead, he refused to believe me. Why, I ask you? Why? Because it wasn't true. Wasn't it because the London Globe had stolen a march on the New York Herald? Or was it because Mr. Stanley had come 11,000 miles for a story and couldn't find one? Gentlemen, among unscrupulous publishers, the method is as old as the newspaper business itself. If you can't find a story, you hire yourself away with pen and paper and you make one. I have here before me a copy of the New York Herald. With your kind indulgence, I will read a small portion of an editorial appearing in it. And I intend to continue making news while my competitors sit around waiting for it to happen. That editorial, gentlemen, is signed by Mr. James Gordon Bennett, publisher of the New York Herald, an employer of Mr. Henry M. Stanley. Do you anything further to say, Mr. Stanley, before this meeting votes on your report? Go on, get up and give it to them. You must. You must, please. Mr. Chairman, and I feel that I should say, gentlemen of the jury, since you have seen fit to turn this hearing into a trial, I stand before you accused of being a cheat, a liar, and a forger. Unfortunately, gentlemen, when you question my integrity, you nullify at the same time the discoveries of Dr. Livingston, and you condemn a great man to oblivion. A great man whom this honorable gathering seems determined to wipe out with a vote. Although today he is still roaming the jungle and swamp, alone and fever ridden. Accomplishing more in every single day than you in your combined lives will ever accomplish. You armchair geographers who have never explored anything deeper than a plum pudding. I realize that this hall is charged with prejudice, and to raise my voice here is to cry out in the wilderness. But I would be violating a sacred trust if I did not cry out, even though only the walls heard me. The walls and a handful of faithful friends. Gentlemen, I, I do not like to think that I am expecting too much when I ask tolerance and fair play from my fellow countrymen. Yes. I was born in England. I went to school here. Not at Eton or Harrow, but at St. Asaph's Workhouse for the Children of Paupers. All I ever knew of England was the poverty and brutality of the workhouse. I grew up with the lesson of my youth burned into my soul. I asked nothing of other men and I gave nothing. A year ago, in darkest Africa, I met a man who restored my faith in the England I had learned to hate as a child. And now you gentlemen are destroying the faith he built in me as you seem bent on destroying every other great accomplishment of the greatest man I have ever known. 
Dr. Livingston is out there. He is old and he is sick. And he needs your help to carry on the great work he has undertaken. The work that is indicated, however inadequately, upon those maps. Reject those maps, withhold your aid, and you destroy him. Reject those maps and you close Africa for generations to come. Reject those maps, gentlemen, and you break faith with the greatest geographer and one of the greatest men of our times. Gentlemen, the choice is yours. Take your vote. I am sure that Dr. Livingston himself would say, I leave it with you. Oh, that was glory. Fine words, Mr. Chairman, but still not one word of proof. <laughs> Henry Forrester. I move that this meeting go on record by putting Mr. Stanley's report to a vote. Yeah. 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 Gentlemen, all those who are in favor of accepting Mr. Stanley's report, please rise. Those who are opposed to accepting Mr. Stanley's report, please rise. Gentlemen, the verdict is clear. It is the sense of this meeting that Mr. Stanley's claim be rejected. The chair will entertain a motion. Sir John! Sir John Gresham! Yes, what is it? A message from Paris. Well, son, I guess you know now how I feel when people won't believe what I tell them. Stanley! Stanley! They're calling the meeting back to order. What of it? Something's happened. We'd better go back. Come on. I've just received a communication from London which I feel is of the utmost importance. I will read it to you without comment. It is from Lord Belhampton and is addressed to me. Sir, a message has just been received from Zanzibar. The body of Dr. David Livingston has been brought to the coast by native bearers. Dr. Livingston died several months ago on a journey to the Lualaba River. That is not all, gentlemen. The letter goes on. The bearers also delivered to the British consul at Zanzibar a last message written by Dr. Livingston in which the doctor mentions Mr. Henry M. Stanley. The following message contains Dr. Livingston's last request and is addressed to Mr. Stanley. Too weak to go on. Have asked that my heart be buried here, together with my dreams. My son, the torch has fallen from my hand. Come and relight it. Mr. Chairman. What tice? Mr. Chairman, I have the very great honor to propose that the previous resolution be stricken from the minutes of this meeting and that we accept Mr. Stanley's report. And with our acceptance, Tender him our humble apologies for our stupidity and bad manners, in which I, Mr. Stanley, have been the greatest offender. Yeah.
Henry had some things sent down, and I want to see if they put them in your cabin. Mr. Henry and Stanley. Here, boy. Stanley? This is Mr. Stanley. I'll be back. Stanley. Thank you. Excuse me. From Bennett, the third today. I don't seem able to convince him I'm not coming to New York. I guess I'll have to name a mountain or something after that. Oh, so well, I guess I'd better get aboard. I won't try to tell you how wonderful it's been to be with you and Gary. You see, I was right. I wasn't imagining things. You are going to follow in Dr. Livingston's footsteps. No man alive could hope to follow in his footsteps. I can at least try to finish the work he started. And I won't be alone when I reach the spot where the Lua Lava meets the sea. Goodbye. Goodbye, Henry. God bless you.